myself that I actually had to do something today other than sit and enjoy good music. <laughs> Welcome one and all into this time of worship as we gather this morning here in this place, as you gather wherever you may be joining us in spirit, we pray as always that you would deeply know the spirit of God present within your lives as well. As we gather this morning, a few announcements to share with one another regarding the week and some of the weeks ahead of us. Uh, as always, during this time, should there be a need or a reason to leave the sanctuary, uh, exits may be found to the rear and down front to the left, and volunteers will be available to help guide you in the right direction on such an occasion. Uh, today, following worship, uh, almost immediately following, even though we can't move up the time of the game, we're going pretty much straight into our uh, fellowship potluck for the afternoon, one of our first potlucks for this fall season. We'll be watching the game upstairs for uh, those of us who are unable to go cheer in person. We're going to cheer loudly from up there. I'm sure that they will be able to hear us from Orchard Park, so we need all voices to be a part of that. Uh, it will be a potluck tailgate theme. You are welcome to come, whether you've signed up or not, whether you have brought something or not, you are welcome to join us, and we pray that you will. It will be a wonderful time of fellowship, and it should be a good celebration. Uh, coming up in this week, I would remind you that Wellspring for Women will continue its, uh, its meetings on Tuesday morning at 9.15 in the Lower Fellowship Hall. The nominating committee is hard at work. There's information about that in the narthex, but I'm not going to speak about that right now because one of the members of our nominating committee will be speaking to that later on in the service, but just be mindful that the information is there and available. Uh, and lastly... On this coming Saturday, October 26th, uh, there will be a, a work day down at Camp Duffield to help get things ready for the winter. So if you've never been to Duffield and you want to know what it's all about, this is a perfect occasion to come and see things and get a sense of it. If you've been to Duffield but it's been a very long time and you'd like to remind yourself of what it feels like to go and visit and walk around the trails and the woods and see everything, you are welcome to come for that as well. But if you would like more information or if you have any questions, please let me know and we'll help coordinate you and get you in the right direction. But that will be a good fall fellowship event. It should be good weather and a good time as usually had by all. I know that there are some other things coming up in the life of the church. Those are in our bulletin and I'm staying connected and we'll call more attention to those as those times get a little bit closer. For today, as we gather now in this time and in this place, Let's take a few moments to still our spirits and our minds in the presence of God. The Lord is our dwelling place a home of peace and plenty. The Lord is our dwelling place, a refuge when trouble is near. Praise the Lord, for God is great indeed. Let us sing praises for God's glorious work. Let us join our voices in song, singing verses 1 through 4 of hymn number 15 in our purple Glory to God hymnals.
God, you show us the way of servanthood. You have given us much so that we can bless others and not seek gratifications for ourselves. Help us to seek your path, and keep us in humility so that we can be the light of Christ in the world. In the name of the one who came to serve, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, in faith, let us confess our sins against God and one another, trusting in the promise of God to redeem and desiring to offer our repentant hearts for the glory of God's kingdom. Let us pray together. Merciful and gentle God, we have wanted reward without sacrifice. We have been unwilling to serve and have not humbled ourselves in obedience. Forgive our hubris, gracious God. Correct our ignorant ways and help us to know your glory through servanthood. Guide us to be true followers of your way through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and the faithfulness of God is steadfast and true. In the love of Christ, know that we are forgiven, healed, and made whole, and in this knowledge may we be at peace. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive and greet one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace be with all of you as well. I, I know that I don't often get out to greet most of you, so good morning and peace be with you. Or not. Peace be with you. Okay. Kids, come on down. Good morning, everyone. So now that we're all sitting down in a nice neat line, I'm going to have you stand up and kind of just feel free to cluster in this kind of space between the, the steps in the front pew. And I want to ask you a question. Take a few moments to look around. How many crosses do you see here in the sanctuary? How many crosses do y'all see? 
All right, so I, I, I hear four, four. <laughs> I heard four, five, and six. How many think four? How many think five? How many think six? Let's start counting. We got one there on the pulpit, a second one there on the table, one big one up there at the front, that's three. Someone pointed out that I have two crosses on my stole, so that's five. You, someone was saying six. Where's the sixth one? What? Oh, there's two on there. Oh, yep, yeah, on the baptismal font. Really, there's four, so that means... Ah. I want you all... Do you see all 19 of the people there? I, see, I counted all y'all. They were counting. I counted. There are 19 people in the choir. And Kodo, she's hiding over behind the organ. So there's... All right, so that's 20... Four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're looking at like 28, 29? Yeah, I, I got these. What if I told you that there's over 120 crosses in this sanctuary right now? Would you believe me? Or would you think that I was... What if I told all of you that are, there are over 120 crosses in this sanctuary right now? I want everyone who has a cross on them to raise their hands. So that should be all the choir. <laughs> How many of you have a cross? How many of you have a cross? Let me ask that a better way. How many of you are a cross? How many of you are a cross? And not in the then you're going to smack your neighbor in your face, and we don't want to do that. Don't, don't do that. I see you. <laughs> all of you are a cross because all of you are children of God and disciples of Jesus. You can have a seat if you want. And that means that each and every single one of us, whether we, we have a piece of clothing or a piece of jewelry or anything else that has a cross on it, that means that all of us in our hearts bear the cross that Jesus has given us as we became members of the church. As we come to church, this is something that we take on. The more we try to be the way Jesus taught us and showed us to be, the more we wear that cross within ourselves. How many of you knew that? Hopefully all of you did. But it's our calling as a congregation to remind our children of that as well. You are each a cross for the world, and that is a good thing, because in the cross we find love, we find compassion, we find mercy and grace, and that is who we are called to be on behalf of the church for the world around us. When we go to school, when we go with our parents to the grocery store or run other errands, when we do other things, we are the church in the world. Are you guys up for that? You ready for it? That's usually my response, too. Sure. Yeah, I'm ready for that. But we come to church on Sunday so that we can help be ready for that for the next week. And then by the end of the week when we're tired, we come back to the church and we start all over. That's what we are for one another. So let's make our freeform shape. And we'll give thanks for all of that. Yeah, come on in. Can you let Madison in? Come on. Yeah, come on in. You can, here. You got elbows with Caden. Yeah, and elbows with Nora. Here we go. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the cross you give us. Thank you for helping us to be your cross in the world. Strengthen us for this, we pray. And help us be your children. Amen. All right, guys. Have fun in junior church.
Let us pray for illumination of the word. O oh God, your word gives us counsel for our understanding. Enable us to receive it this day in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. First reading this morning is from the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. It can be found in the Pew Bible on page 458. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Our psalm this morning Is, is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 9 and 24. It's in the bulletin. It also can be found in the Pew Bible on page 525. We'll read it responsibly. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. See the Lord in his strength. See his presence in Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. The the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac. And the Lord made his people very and made be seated. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. It may be found in your pew Bibles on page 44 if you wish to follow along, but let us listen for God's word to us today. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to him, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. 
but it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, these are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Holy One, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Everything I had thought was wrong. Everything I expected to see was wrong. William Shatner could be considered to be the quintessential face of space exploration and going to the edges of what is known to see what is out there, to boldly go where no one has gone before. From three years and almost 80 episodes, to say nothing of numerous movies and guest appearances, Shatner's character of James T. Kirk, captain of the Starship Enterprise, has become synonymous with space exploration. So when William Shatner was set to go to outer space, leaving the Earth's atmosphere aboard a Blue Origin vessel, many of us, including Shatner himself, saw it as a natural next step. He was going to be able to do what few actors had ever been able to do, to experience the milieu in real life of what he portrayed so often on the screen. The expectation was that everything he had imagined about space, everything he dreamed and envisioned about the experience of being in space, would be verified and made real. No one, including himself, saw coming the actual experience. That instead of finding space to be the great invitation to an expanse of life and possibility, that he would look out and see nothing. An emptiness that was more vast than he possibly could have comprehended. In response to his imagined engagement with the mystery of space, he reflected there was no mystery, no majesty, no majestic awe to behold. All I saw was death. Well, most of us live our daily lives in what Ron Heifetz, leadership development coach, would call the dance floor view. And that's not a critique, it's just a recognition. But he posits that for the most part, we move through our daily lives focused on what's immediate, what's right in front of us, what we're doing and how that's affected by what other people are doing. He likens it then to a large group of people in a dance hall. Everyone hears the same music and joins in the dance, but each participant is only focused on their own movements and really is only aware of what is immediately around them in their sphere. All that is known from the dance floor view is what can be seen right where you are. Or to use another metaphor, it's like being unable to see the forest for all the trees, though that one's a bit more of a critical metaphor. According to Heifetz, recognizing that one is seeing the world through the perspective of the dance floor is not a negative, it's just a recognition. But forming our understanding from this view alone can lead us to some less than comprehensive perspectives or to a view that is not encompassing all that it should. We become misaligned then with the greater calling, the greater reality. And this was the case with William Shatner. All his life he held an understanding of space based on his acting, his experiences, his imagination. All he knew of space was from what he could perceive, 
playing such a role. And that wasn't wrong, per se, it just also wasn't completely right. And it pushed his perspective then in a direction that was ultimately less than effective. Well, this perspective is also precisely where Job, James, and John are right now in our readings of this morning. And Job, especially, we can understand. After all he has gone through, after all he has suffered and that has been lost, he desires nothing more than to place his grievance before God, certain that he is in the right, and that in making his argument he will be vindicated. His perspective at this point in the story, before meeting with God, is that of the dance floor. He may be aware that there are other people out there living their lives in the great big world, but all of his understanding, all his view, is based on his own personal sphere. Again, not wrong, but not completely right either. And to less extreme extents, this is true for most of us. We go about our days mindful of our schedules, our needs, our interests and desires. We know there's a big world out there, but we focus on our perspective and understanding through what is immediately before us each day. Whatever happens is most often filtered through the lens of, how does this affect me? We see this also in the very understandable and relatable concerns of James and John. In many ways, they are still struggling with accepting and comprehending what Jesus has told all the disciples, that he is to be handed over and crucified, and that as Messiah, he will not be a warrior king, a conquering hero. And with all that, the disciples will face similar realities. James and John, perhaps being cousins of Jesus, want to ensure that they, at least, receive a greater measure of recognition and glory, and perhaps even a slightly easier road. Their concern, their perspective, is of the impact upon themselves. They are viewing the dance from the level of the dance floor, to use Heifetz's illustration. When we allow ourselves to see the world, to understand the world primarily through our own perspective, then that alone is what directs our attention and our actions, and in ways that primarily benefit us. Again, not a critique but rather a recognition of how the process works. Whether it be each of us in our daily living, or William Shatner going to space with a specific expectation of validating everything he's dreamed and imagined, or James and John wanting to secure their place, or Job seeking vindication that he has been unduly beset upon by suffering, the dance floor view centers me and mine with little room for anything or anyone else. But there's another view as well, to balance out the dance floor view. Heifetz also talks about the balcony view, wherein someone is up above the dance floor and can see the whole picture at a glance. From this perspective, everything is visible. Someone taking the balcony view can see how movement over in this corner affects what is happening, influencing and directing people in movements on the other side of the room. And again, this is not meant to be a better view, but it is a balance to the dance floor view. Ideally, the two views are held in tension in a conversation in which each informs the other so that the best action, the most effective movement, is achieved. We see this in response to our examples already listed today. In response to James and John, as Jesus reminds them that even if they are able to drink the cup that he must drink, 
what they are asking is not within the realm of granting. More than that, Jesus reminds them that the mission they are about, namely the bringing of salvation and good news into the world, is not about them. It's about the world. And it's about the presence of God, the kingdom of God in the world. Job, in an even more blatant example, receives a response that many biblical scholars argue is not actually a direct response. As he lays his argument before God, as he makes his case and claims for vindication, God instead responds with, Were you there when the universe was created, formed and fashioned with a thought and a word? Or where were you when the waters of the ocean were told to come this far and no further? Were you the one to place the stars in the heavens and appoint the courses of the planets? In short, Job may be correct in his arguments, but there's a bigger perspective at play as well. And Job has lost sight of it and his place within it. As I mentioned last week, wisdom literature in the Bible is all about helping us to realign with the grand scheme of creation, our place in it, and who we are in relation with God. In both of these instances, the attempt of reminding James, John, and Job of the balcony view in such an abrupt manner is a shock, but it is meant to bring them back into balance, back into perspective. They had shifted too far into their own dance floor perspective. They needed to be reminded of the other end of the spectrum as well. And from this, the hope is that they would be able to live, to act, and ultimately to minister more effectively, more faithfully again. Shatner spent his life looking to the stars, envisioning and imagining life and exploration out there. His actual encounter with space, moving himself from the dance floor view to the balcony view, was jarring, but it did have the effect of helping him balance and realign his perspective. Rather than looking always to the vast mystery of space for answers, he realized what gifts we have here at hand. I had thought that going into space would be the ultimate catharsis of that connection that I had been looking for between all living things. I had a different experience because I discovered that the beauty isn't out there. It's down here with all of us. Leaving that behind made my connection to our tiny planet even more profound. When we balance our own dance floor view with the balcony view, especially in the light of faith and the promise of the good news of the resurrection, it affects and directs how we respond to the world and what actions we take. We recognize that there is immense suffering and that sometimes we are the ones who suffer so, but that there is also an immense beauty in the world and a God who has not deserted us or it. And rather than being beaten down by difficulties, we are able to face them and faithfully proclaim that there is something more, and that we are agents of that something, the very kingdom of God. It is easy to be drawn to live only in our own immediate dance floor view. It's it's what's right around us, and we are creatures wired to see to our own well-being. But in faith, we know and understand that we are created in the image of God and set only a little lower than the angels. As we strive to keep a balance between our immediate view and our big picture view, the dance floor and the balcony, we do so so that we may live in faith and proclaim to a world in need that there is life, there is hope, there is good. We are so called, and may we so live and make such proclamation for the glory of God. And as 
we respond to the word of God which we have heard this day, let us join our voices singing together hymn number 816. affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We live into the fullness of faith in our covenant relationship with one another as we join our hearts and voices in prayer, mindful of those who are close to us and known to us, those whom we hold within our hearts and whom we name to each other, mindful of those near and those around the world in need, and those who are known only to God. Let us lift our spirits and pray. Gracious Lord, as we come to you again this day, we give thanks for the gifts that we have received in this day. We are grateful for the joy of fellowship and communion that we share with one another in this time of worship. We are grateful for the beauty of this day around us and the promise that life in this day brings. And we are aware as well of the gift that we share connecting us to each other your spirit, which does not leave us in isolation, but creates between us a covenant connection 
with all who are known to us, with all who call out to you in faith, and with all who, with whom we share this world. And so in this day, in gratitude, we pray for those who are in need especially. We pray for family and friends who are grieving, who mourn the loss of loved ones, who mourn the distance that now exists between them and another, the separation that so often divides and makes distance distant that which you have called and claimed to be close. We pray for those who are injured and ill, who are in need of healing, who yearn for wholeness in body and in spirit, who desire clarity of mind and an understanding of what decisions to make as they move themselves forward in this life. We pray for those whose struggles are known only to you. We pray for those who are unsure of what the way forward is, or even where they are to begin such a journey. We pray particularly for those who continue to rebuild in the aftermath of natural disasters and tragedies, for the people in North Carolina and Tennessee and Florida and other parts of our country. We pray for all who have experienced such devastation, regardless of where they are in this world, as they seek to rebuild and reclaim the day and the days to come. We pray for all who are in need this day, O Lord, those who are hungry for their next meal and thirsty for a drink of water, those who hunger for justice and thirst for righteousness. May we all be gifted and uplifted to celebrate with one another and to proclaim the goodness of your kingdom here and now and everywhere around us. Lord, trusting in your spirit, we make these prayers. And we pray together in the way that you have taught generations of the faithful to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to offer our gifts and our time, I'd like to first invite Bob Posick on behalf of our nominating committee to come and speak for a few minutes about the work that they, as a committee, are about in these days and weeks in the life of the church. Good morning. I'm Bob Posick, and I am co-chair of the nomination committee, along with Mary Barron. You probably have heard the expression, many hands make light work. Nowhere is that as true as in our church family. There are a number of tasks that need to be handled so our church meets its obligation and functions smoothly. Fortunately, members of our congregation step forward to serve on the church's various boards and committees. By sharing the load, it is not a burden on anyone, and it is actually fun and satisfying to work together to get things done. We're now at that time of year where we need to fill vacancies on three of the church's boards and one committee. Those boards are the session, trustees, and deacons, and the nominating committee. First, the session. There are 15 elders who serve on the session. It's the major policy-making body of the church. The session operates several committees. Second, the trustees. There are 12 trustees who are responsible for the church building and grounds, as well as finances. Third, the deacons. There are 12 deacons who provide sympathy, caring, and support to those in need. And fourth, there's the nominating committee. Nominating committee works the last quarter of the year 
and prepares a slate of nominations for vacancies as needed. That's where we are right now and we're asking for your help. You will find in the rear of the church nice blue forms like this one that can be used for submitting nominations for consideration. The form gives more information on the boards than I've been able to do. You can also submit nominations online through Staying Connected. It's very easy. It's the first thing in Staying Connected. It's an easy tap and, and easy to uh, maneuver. It will guide you through the process. We're asking that nominations be submitted by October 31st. Note that only church members may serve on boards. You can nominate yourself if there's a board or committee whose work you are drawn to. That is not being proud, proud to put yourself forward. It's being humble to say, I'm willing to serve and I think my gifts would be helpful here. Um, please help this process so that we all share the work of the church in a way that profits everyone but burdens no one. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And now, as a people of God who have received good gifts, let us offer out of those gifts in response for the life and ministry of the congregation.
gracious Lord, for the gifts that we have received and the gifts that we now humbly offer, we give thanks. And we pray that in the fullness of your spirit, these gifts would proclaim good news to those who are in need and proclaim joy to those who want. Bless the gift and the giver. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And friends, let us once more join our voices singing together hymn number 321. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace, now and always. Amen and amen. Thank you. 